The Vietnam War would see the realization of the Vietnamese dream of a single, unified, independent country taking its place in the world, free of outside oppression and rule. It is the type of story that has been retold throughout history, and had it occurred at any other point in history, then it would likely have been largely forgotten outside of the small Southeast Asian country, as so many wars of independence are. But because of events elsewhere in the world, the battlefields of Vietnam became one of the most important on Earth at the time, for it was here that two ideological superpowers, the Democratic West and Communist East, would come to blows, not being able to fight one another directly because they would destroy themselves in a nuclear fire, they instead fought through the Vietnamese people. This is the story of the Vietnam War. They say war never changes, but on this channel, we know that each conflict has its own unique set of challenging circumstances that shapes the world around it. And that includes the impact on the economy. War can be big business until it isn't. Financially, things are tough right now. It seems that we're all looking at ways to deal with the increased cost of living and coping with inflation levels being at a 40-year high. Today's sponsor, Masterworks, offer one way to invest in your future, learning from the professionals. Throughout history, people have fought to preserve and protect great works of art during times of crisis and war. It's about preserving cultural heritage, but it has the side effect of making those pieces of art secure items to invest in during times of uncertainty. According to the MW All Art Index, art prices appreciated 17.5% on average between 1973 and 1981, when inflation was as high as it is now. With today's sponsor, Masterworks, you can invest in blue chip art from legendary artists like Picasso and Banksy without having to spend the millions most of us don't have. Firstly, Masterworks purchased the paintings up front with their own capital, qualifies offerings with the SEC. Then you invest in the art, and Masterworks holds the paintings until they have appreciated enough in value. Finally, they're sold, allowing net returns to be delivered to you, the investor. Nearly 600,000 people have signed up to Masterworks so far, and with inflation still high, the list of investors is growing, and you could be a part of it you'll get priority access with the link in the description. You don't have to be a millionaire to be able to invest in art safely and to your means. Thank you, Masterworks, for sponsoring today's episode. Welcome to Wars of the World. In the 17th century, French and Portuguese Catholic missionaries reached Southeast Asia with the aim of spreading Catholicism to the region. At that time, the region was heavily divided between local rulers who frequently fought amongst one another, and so the French deployed troops to protect the missionaries. Over the following 200 years, the French would increasingly involve themselves in the affairs of the area providing soldiers to aid local warlords who were more willing to cooperate with the French against those who were not. Over time, they gained more and more territory in the region, either through deception, negotiation, or more often than not, warfare. This culminated in 1887, with the establishment of a federation of French colonial possessions known as French Indochina. The French colonial government exploited their subjects, imposing extortionate taxes on them for key goods such as salt and opium. French Indochina would expand at the end of the 19th century, with territories ceded from neighboring Siam in 1893, and then more again in 1907, although in the mid-1930s, some of these territories would be returned. However, opposition to the French in the region was never stamped out by the colonial government, resulting in several movements being formed, aimed at removing them and creating a new, independent nation. One such movement was the Vietnam Quoc Zen Dan, or simply Viet Quoc. Originating in the city of Hanoi, 
In 1927, the Viet Quoc began a campaign of assassination of French officials, resulting in a brutal crackdown of their members, which saw almost a third of them being arrested by French security forces. This didn't stop their campaign, however, and on February 10th, 1930, they organized a Vietnamese army mutiny at the Yen Bai Barracks, which ultimately failed. The French brutally punished members and supporters of the Viet Quoc, putting many of them to death. The Viet Quoc slowly lost its influence afterwards, but another nationalist movement was already gaining support and would dramatically affect the political landscape of the region over the next 30 years. In 1917, Imperial Russia was rocked by revolution, resulting in the overthrowing of the Tsar and the creation of the world's first communist superpower, the Soviet Union. Many in the Soviet Union wanted to spread their communist ideals beyond their own borders and instigate a new world order embracing communist ideology. And to achieve this, Soviet leader Vladimir Lenin created the Comintern, an international organization aimed at plotting and supporting more revolutions across the globe. In 1923, a new member arrived in Moscow to receive ideological and practical training in instigating a communist revolution. His name was Ho Chi Minh. Ho Chi Minh's early life is vague in places, either because of the lack of adequate record keeping amongst Indochina's local population, and sometimes because he would later give contradictory information about his life. His published birth date is May 19th, 1890, and his father was a magistrate who was eventually dismissed from his post for abusing power. In 1911, Ho Chi Minh found employment on a French ship under the alias Van Bar to disguise his involvement in anti-slavery protests and worked on a variety of ships, traveling the globe, visiting, among others, France, the UK, and the USA. In 1919, he returned to France, by which time he was becoming more and more politically minded. He met a group of other Indo-Chinese living in Paris, who as well as advocating for their homeland's independence, had become enamored with the ideals of communism. Being primarily a rural people, and having been oppressed by the imperialist French for so long, the dream of communism, in which power was distributed amongst the people and not the elite few, found fruition amongst many of the indigenous peoples of Southeast Asia, something that would alarm Western powers, especially the United States, in the years to come. While in Paris, Ho Chi Minh campaigned for his people to have a say in the terms of the Versailles Treaty that ended World War I, and appealed to world leaders to push France to grant Indochina independence. The fact that 100,000 men from Indochina had fought for the French in the trenches of the Western Front earned them some support, but both efforts would prove fruitless, although they would raise his profile back home as a man leading the call for freedom. The lack of support from the democratic West only pushed Ho Chi Minh and his compatriots closer to Moscow and to communism, and this in turn led to him taking an active role in promoting communism within France itself. In fact, he was one of the founding members of the French Communist Party. In 1923, he began making his way east, posing as a Chinese merchant in order to reach Moscow and attend the Comintern. After that, he made his way to China and began teaching Indo-Chinese people living there the communist way and would eventually become the Comintern's senior agent in Southeast Asia. On October 18, 1926, the 36-year-old Ho Chi Minh married a 21-year-old Chinese girl by the name of Zhen Zwiming, despite protests by his comrades, which he flatly ignored. Over the coming decade, Ho Chi Minh would travel the length and breadth of Europe and Asia in the service of world communism, meeting members of communist groups as far afield as France, Belgium, Italy, India, China, and Thailand. In his native land, the French were still coming down hard on suspected revolutionaries, making the communist parties in both France and Indochina illegal in 1939. But the French were soon becoming more concerned with the growing threat from Japan and the fear that the communists in China might win the civil war raging there. France itself was plunged into war with Germany in September of 1939, and within a year would fall to the German Blitzkrieg. France's empire was now under the control of the Vichy French, who had limited military power, and so with little in the way of opposition, the Japanese marched into Indochina on September 22, 1940. 
The Japanese objective was to blockade supplies to China, whom they had been engaged in war with since 1937. For the Vietnamese people, Japanese occupation was just as, if not more, brutal as the French rule had been, and Ho Chi Minh and his followers knew that the chaos of the war was the ideal time to strike back at the invaders of their homeland. He therefore reorganized a previously collapsed nationalist group into the Viet Minh, which had the goal of pushing back the Japanese and their new French puppets and freeing Indochina to become an independent communist nation. The movement enjoyed popular support, claiming a membership of some half a million strong by the end of 1944, thanks to their prioritizing the independence of Vietnam over their own communist agenda, which meant that non-communist nationalist groups allied themselves under the Viet Minh banner. At first, they used weapons smuggled from China or captured from the French and Japanese, but when the US entered the war on September 7, 1941, the Viet Minh began receiving funding and equipment from the United States. The Viet Minh proved a deadly enemy to the Japanese, fully exploiting their knowledge of their own country. Ho Chi Minh established his base in the north, near the border with China, so he could meet with his Chinese communist allies regularly. During one such meeting, Ho Chi Minh was captured by the Chinese Kuomintang, the enemies of the Chinese communists in their suspended civil war, and held prisoner for two years, at which time he was allowed to return to his home country and continue leading the fight against the Japanese. By 1945, the Japanese were in full retreat across Asia and the Pacific. On March 9th, 1945, they disposed of their French puppets and agreed to break up French Indochina into separate parts, each with their own governments, all allied to Japan. This saw Laos and Cambodia declare independence, but the recently liberated French made it clear they planned to regain control of their lost territories in the future. This was also a warning for the Viet Minh. Even before the Japanese surrendered, new French officials were parachuted into Indochina by American aircraft, an extremely dangerous task since they were hunted by both the Japanese and the Viet Minh. The Viet Minh had waged a brutal four-year campaign against the Japanese and the Vichy French and were not about to simply let the French take over again. On August 15, 1945, the Japanese in Indochina finally surrendered, and the Viet Minh wasted no time in attempting to secure the country for themselves before the French could fully reassert themselves. In both the North and South, Communist forces under Ho Chi Minh seized towns and cities, and on September 2nd, 1945, he declared that Vietnam was now an independent nation. In his speech, he quoted the American Declaration of Independence, stating, All men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This immortal statement was made in the Declaration of Independence of the United States of America in 1776. In a broader sense, this means all the peoples on the earth are equal from birth. All the peoples have a right to live and to be happy and free. He also quoted a similar sentiment from the French Revolution, perhaps hoping to secure sympathies from the people who had oppressed them for so long and had themselves been oppressed under Nazi occupation. The problem for Ho Chi Minh was that Vietnam still held thousands of Japanese troops that now needed repatriation to their own country. At the Potsdam Conference, the Allies divided Vietnam along the 16th parallel, with China taking responsibility for rounding up the Japanese north of the parallel and the Allies taking responsibility for the south. Unfortunately for Ho Chi Minh, the British forces that arrived in the south of Vietnam brought with them French troops, who immediately began fighting the communists south of the 16th parallel. Managing to hold the north's capital of Hanoi, Ho Chi Minh went about securing his position by eliminating rivals, many of whom had fought with the Viet Minh throughout the war. Now in full control, he knew he had to try to negotiate with the French or face all-out war. War with the Viet Minh was not in the interest of France either, who were locked in negotiation with the Chinese, who demanded the French withdraw from their holdings in Chinese ports in exchange for Chinese troops leaving northern Indochina. On March 6, 1946, Ho Chi Minh and the French finally reached an agreement, but it didn't wholly satisfy either party. Instead of attaining true Vietnamese independence, 
Ho Chi Minh agreed to his government being identified as a free state within the Indo-Chinese Federation of the French Union. The French were forced to agree to two provisions. Firstly, they promised not to station more than 15,000 troops north of the 16th parallel. Secondly, a referendum was to be held on the issue of reunifying the Vietnamese governments of Indochina. It was regarding the latter provision that relations between the French and Ho Chi Minh's government deteriorated. Repeated efforts to agree on how the referendum would be held failed to reach a consensus, and by November 1946, both sides armed for war. After tensions rose to boiling point, open warfare broke out on December 16, 1946. The first shots of what history remembers as the First Indochina War occurred after Viet Minh and French soldiers got into an argument in the port city of Haiphong over import tax duty. The French Navy responded by bombarding the Vietnamese section of the city, killing 6,000 people in a single afternoon. The Viet Minh abandoned the city for a time, but had no intention of giving up their claim, and a 30,000-strong force under General Giap launched a counterattack. But despite enjoying numerical superiority, the opposing French enjoyed a technological edge and were able to repel the Vietnamese forces. A few weeks later, the Viet Minh were forced to retreat from the cities they held, including Hanoi, and began another guerrilla war in the dense jungles of the countryside. A curious fact about this period is that the Viet Minh's numbers now included former Japanese army members who did not wish to return home to Japan because they felt disgrace at having lost the war or feared persecution and even death for war crimes. The French soon adopted a policy of establishing heavily fortified positions in and around towns and cities in an effort to make the Viet Minh attack them where they could be destroyed. The Viet Minh, on the other hand, realized this and limited their attacks to supply lines leading to these positions, effectively laying siege to the French. The result was that while it allowed the French to maintain control of key areas, the war became a long, drawn-out slog, with no apparent end in sight. Much of the rest of the world paid little attention to the war in Indochina at first, but that soon began to change as events elsewhere made the US particularly reassess its view of the situation. The breakdown of relations between Washington and Moscow at the start of the Cold War made American policymakers worry about what a French defeat in Indochina might do regarding the geopolitical map of Asia. If Vietnam became an independent communist nation, then others in the region may follow in a domino effect. This worry was only reinforced when the Chinese Civil War resumed and resulted in a communist victory, meaning the Viet Minh now had an undisputed powerful supporter on its northern border. Communist China instead intervened in the North Korean effort to defeat South Korea and its US allies in the Korean War between 1950 and 1953, a conflict that ultimately ended in stalemate. Meanwhile, Washington watched nervously as the French failed to defeat the Viet Minh. France's post-war economy was focused on rebuilding after Nazi occupation, and so the United States began funding France's war effort against Ho Chi Minh's forces. At one point, the US was funding over 80% of the war efforts, but the people of France were growing tired of war, and protests against continuing it took place in French cities in 1954. On March 13th of that same year, the war was on the verge of its climax when French paratroopers landed near the village of Dien Bien Phu and established a series of fortified positions. The operation was aimed at cutting off Viet Minh supplies from neighboring Laos and the paratroopers would be supplied from the air. The French committed over 20,000 men and 400 transport and combat aircraft to the operation but they faced a Vietnamese force numbering 49,500 in that region. The French established their fortified positions and were immediately put under siege by the Vietnamese, who used anti-aircraft guns to great effect in shooting down the resupply aircraft. The battlefield itself relied heavily on trench warfare, such as that seen in World War I, since both sides had an abundance of artillery pieces. With their supplies dwindling amid tenacious Viet Minh assaults, the French lines began to contract further back until after nearly two months of constant fighting, 
the French garrison was overrun. Nearly 3,000 French soldiers were killed, and nearly 12,000 were marched into prisoner of war camps. It was a devastating blow, and the French Prime Minister resigned immediately afterwards, and his replacement advocated for French troops to withdraw. However, they couldn't simply leave the country for Ho Chi Minh's forces to slaughter the remaining allied French Vietnamese. Thus, at the 1954 Geneva Accords, which ended the fighting, France agreed to withdraw its forces from all colonies in French Indochina, granting Laos and Cambodia true independence, while stipulating that Vietnam would be temporarily divided at the 17th parallel. Control of the North would be given to the Viet Minh as the Democratic Republic of Vietnam under Ho Chi Minh, while the South would become the state of Vietnam under Emperor Bao Dai. Communist elements in the South would also have to relocate to the North, while large numbers of people in the North relocated South as a result of a CIA operation. Both sides agreed that elections would be held on reunification at some point in the future. It wasn't the total victory Ho Chi Minh had dreamed of, but at least half of his country was now free. Ho Chi Minh now focused on building his new country in the north after the Geneva Accords, and while he never gave up the dream of reunification, he did encourage his people to have patience. He immediately began a diplomatic campaign to secure vital aid from the Soviet Union and his old ally China to help prop up the war-ravaged country, which was on the verge of widespread famine. The Soviet Union offered its help in the way of aid and technical assistance to build up infrastructure and the country's armed forces. North Vietnam already had huge numbers of combat-proven and experienced soldiers to form an army, but now the Soviets were helping to establish the North Vietnamese Air Force and Navy as well. Perhaps not wanting to lose influence over Ho Chi Minh, the Chinese offered to match and even better the Soviet offer. In the South, even before the French started pulling out, the United States began dealing with the South Vietnamese government directly, including South Vietnam joining the US-sponsored Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, a military alliance akin to NATO in Europe, aimed at preventing communism from spreading. As in the North, the South turned to its own Cold War ally for financial and military aid, which, while it did help rebuild the country, only further alienated the two sides of the 17th parallel, and made the chances of the reunification election all the more difficult. This suited the US, because they firmly believed that if the elections were held, then Ho Chi Minh would win, because not just in the north and south of Vietnam, but across the world, he was seen as the man who freed his people from French oppression. An election victory would give Ho Chi Minh a legitimate claim to all of Vietnam, and as such, the US would lose the country to communism, something that was both practically and militarily unthinkable for the Americans. In 1955, a referendum was held in South Vietnam to determine its future government, which was won by No Dinh Diem, defeating Bao Dai, who abdicated leaving South Vietnam to become a republic. This pleased the US, who saw Diem as someone they could work with, and who would install a more democratic way of life for those in the South. However, for those who believed Vietnam would be reunified, Diem was an unwelcome arrival, for even before the referendum was held, he declared publicly he would not entertain the idea of a referendum, citing he believed no free elections could ever be held in the communist North. But Diem himself was just as guilty of curtailing his own people's democratic freedoms. In fact, the referendum that brought him to power was itself rigged. In Saigon, for example, he claimed over 600,000 votes when there were only 450,000 registered voters in the city. As for implementing Western democracy, he instead used the police and army to clamp down on political rivals, remnant Viet Minh, and religious groups who didn't subscribe to his Catholicism, such as the Buddhist monks, many of whom would turn to self-immolation in protest. With no elections in sight, the thousands of Viet Minh fighters who relocated north were soon becoming restless, agitated, and even homesick. 
They began demanding that Ho Chi Minh's government sponsor an insurgency, but Ho Chi Minh was hesitant to engage in yet another war, so soon after North Vietnam gained independence. Nevertheless, he faced stiff opposition from within his own party, until January 1959, when the North Vietnamese Communist Party elected to begin supporting communist revolution in the South, with over 4,500 southern-born Viet Minh in the North returning to their homeland to begin the campaign. To supply them, a series of trails were cut through the Cambodian and Laotian countrysides to allow them to bypass the defenses of the 17th parallel, which was officially a demilitarized zone, or DMZ. These trails would eventually become known as the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and as well as roads, would feature command posts, supply posts, field hospitals, and education centers. South Vietnam was already descending into a state of chaos, as resentment of Diem's government and his subsequent crackdowns grew in ferocity, and this provided fertile ground for the recruitment of new pro-communist nationalists by the revolutionaries coming from the north. Violence was quick to take hold, and over the span of a single year, there were 1,400 assassinations of government officials in the south, even without influence from the north. Communist and nationalist revolts were breaking out spontaneously in operation to Diem's government, leaving South Vietnam in a de facto state of civil war. On January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy became the 35th President of the United States and vowed to take a tough stance against the spread of communism. Almost immediately, Kennedy found himself thrust into one of the tensest periods in the Cold War, with the Soviet Union resuming atmospheric nuclear testing before then closing off East Berlin and building the Berlin Wall. For his part, Kennedy authorized the catastrophic Bay of Pigs invasion in an attempt to overthrow Fidel Castro in Cuba and increase the US defensive posture with new military re-equipment programs. While these events took the public light, Kennedy and his staff were increasingly concerned with the unrest and communist insurgency in South Vietnam. In May 1961, Kennedy dispatched his vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson, to Vietnam to meet with Dim and pledge even more support to reshape the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, or the ARVN, into a more credible fighting force. As well as US military equipment, this included an increasing number of American advisors to train the ARVN in American tactics to complete the NLF, who were referred to by the South and the US as the Viet Cong, or simply VC. Later in the year, the US sponsored the Strategic Hamlet Program, which aimed to curtail the Viet Cong's ability to recruit from the peasant populations by relocating them from their ancestral lands and into protected hamlets where as well as security, the peasants would receive government support and education. It was a failure, and alienated huge numbers of people, while much of the aid earmarked for the program was embezzled by corrupt South Vietnamese authorities. Kennedy also authorized Operation Ranch Hand, which involved spraying defoliants and pesticides over the jungle to kill off the dense vegetation in an effort to deprive the Viet Cong of cover and food. Operation Ranch Hand would not be suspended until 1971. With American forces having more and more influence over the ARVN's operations, they undertook more aggressive operations against the Viet Cong, resulting in a series of brutal battles that increasingly used helicopters flown by US pilots. The South Vietnamese undertook search and destroy operations based on intelligence reports of Viet Cong operating in a specific area. Helicopters would fly South Vietnamese troops into the area ahead of an enemy unit, while armored units would flank them, forcing them to stand and fight. If the Viet Cong did manage to escape, then the helicopters could fly the South Vietnamese troops ahead of them and ambush them again. At first, the US Army pilots flew their South Vietnamese allies into battle aboard the rather ungainly looking Piasetsky CH-21C helicopter, but increasing numbers of newer, smaller, and faster Bell UH-1s began to arrive, which would later become one of the enduring symbols of the war itself. They became known as Hueys to their pilots, after being initially designated HU-1. 
While this designation was later switched around, the name stuck. The Huey would prove easily adaptable and could carry a wide variety of roles, from basic troop transport to casualty evacuation, and later would be developed into a flying gunship armed with rockets, guns, and grenade launchers. It would even serve as the basis for the dedicated AH-1 Huey Cobra gunship, the forerunner to today's AH-64 Apache. The early search and destroy operations were quite successful, and as well as hurting the Viet Cong, they also raised South Vietnamese morale. The Viet Cong leadership knew they had to change tactics to combat their helicopters, and one of the key changes they made was instead of trying to run away from the landing zones, they would ambush the helicopters as they landed, where the South Vietnamese troops would be bunched up and out in the open, making them easier targets. These new tactics saw a reversal of fortunes for the South Vietnamese. At the Battle of At Bac on January 2nd, 1963, the South Vietnamese would lose five helicopters and eight more damaged, as well as 83 soldiers killed when they were ambushed. Morale in the South began to fall once again, and as before, the frustration was focused on Dim's corrupt government. Although he believed in the importance of the US mission in South Vietnam, Kennedy quietly voiced his concerns about their chances of ultimate success. He is reported to have said in 1963, we don't have a prayer of staying in Vietnam. Those people hate us. But he was trapped by an upcoming election, which he knew he would lose if he pulled out US support, looking weak to his political enemies. He did, however, plan a moderate downscaling of US advisors in Vietnam, which would be completed by the end of 1965, after the election. It was clear that Dim had to go, but he refused to step down when the US began pushing him out. In October 1963, the US learned of a military coup being formulated against him, led by General Van Min. Kennedy decided to support the coup, and on November 1st, 1963, Min's soldiers arrested Dim and his brother before murdering them, something Kennedy was appalled by. Three weeks later, Kennedy himself was assassinated in Texas, and Lyndon Johnson assumed the presidency. Despite his own personal reservations, one of the first things President Johnson did regarding Vietnam was to reverse Kennedy's decision to begin withdrawing US advisors from the country, which at that time numbered some 15,000 troops. In the wake of the coup against Dim, a military junta was established in Saigon under General Van Min, but within three months, he himself was toppled in yet another coup, led by Nguyen Khan, another officer in the ARVN. Khan saw several leading figures in General Min's government murdered, and soon Saigon was rocked by riots, violence, and more Buddhist protests. The instability in Saigon worried Johnson, but with the 1964 elections looming, he too couldn't afford to look weak on foreign policy, and so he had to keep up the effort against the Viet Cong and their supporters in the North. His chance to demonstrate his resolve against the communists in Southeast Asia came in August of 1964. On August 2nd, the US Navy destroyer USS Maddox was conducting a signals intelligence patrol in the Gulf of Tonkin off North Vietnam, intercepting military radio transmissions following a South Vietnamese commando raid on a radar installation based on Hon Mi Island. Three North Vietnamese P-4 torpedo boats approached the Maddox, which responded by firing warning shots. The North Vietnamese boats replied with torpedoes and machine gun fire, prompting the Maddox to fire directly on them. When the boats were first sighted, a flight of four F-8 Crusaders were launched from the aircraft carrier USS Ticonderoga, and as the shooting began, they were ordered to attack the torpedo boats. In the exchange of fire, one Crusader was damaged, as were all three North Vietnamese torpedo boats, with four of their crew being killed. The Maddox itself only received a single hit from a machine gun bullet. On August 4th, the Maddox, accompanied by a second destroyer, carried out another patrol off the North Vietnamese coast in order to demonstrate that the previous attack would not deter the US Navy. The ships detected torpedo boats on radar and fired upon them, claiming they had sunk too. However, it is now widely accepted that no attack took place, since no wreckage or bodies were ever found, and that the radar targets they were shooting at were false, a result of poor weather at the time. Nevertheless, to the American people, the US Navy had been attacked twice, and Johnson had to respond in force. 
On August 10th, even as details of what had happened in both incidents were still being disseminated, the US Congress passed the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, authorizing Johnson to take military action against North Vietnam and the Viet Cong. Johnson wasted no time in deploying additional troops to South Vietnam, with numbers reaching 23,000 by the end of the year, under the command of General William Westmoreland. Additional combat aircraft were now deployed, including a number of B-57 Canberra bombers, to Ben Hoa Air Base. On November 1st, these bombers became the target of a Viet Cong mortar attack, which saw five of them destroyed and 13 others damaged, with four airmen being killed. Two days later, on November 3rd, Johnson won an overwhelming victory in the 1964 election, while polls showed that around half the population supported his military action in Vietnam. As American support for the South ramped up, plans were made for a sustained air campaign against the North. The air campaign was designed to demonstrate that the United States had total control of the air and could attack anywhere at any time. It was hoped by demonstrating this that the North Vietnamese people would first lose faith in Ho Chi Minh's government and secondly, lose the will to continue the war. It was also aimed to improve morale in the South and discourage support for the Viet Cong on both sides of the DMZ. Airstrikes were also ordered against the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos and its endpoints in South Vietnam, but not in Cambodia, which was officially neutral. The US Air Force and Navy leaderships had a clear military strategy in mind for combating the North. However, they found that the White House intended to keep them on a very tight leash. Every target had to be specifically authorized by the White House before it could be attacked, and the pilots were forced to operate under extremely strict rules of engagement. The White House reasoning for these restrictions was that they were acutely aware of thousands of Chinese and Soviet advisors training the North Vietnamese in operating their equipment to use against the Americans. This included MiG fighters and the new deadly surface-to-air missile systems known as SAMs. Johnson and his staff feared that if these Soviet advisors were killed by American bombs, then it would widen the war with direct Soviet involvement and maybe even lead to a global confrontation. This meant that US pilots were forbidden from attacking the MiG bases or the SAM sites. As for the targets selected, they were often of questionable value, and targets in and around Hanoi and the port city of Haiphong were strictly prohibited. According to US Air Force historian Earl Tilford, Quote, Targeting bore little resemblance to reality, in that the sequence of attacks was uncoordinated and the tactics were approved randomly, even illogically. Operation Rolling Thunder was officially authorized on February 24, 1965, with the first attack occurring on March 2nd, when 100 US and Vietnamese Air Force planes attacked an ammunition base at Zom Bang. With the MiG bases spared, it meant that the North Vietnamese Air Force were free to attack the American formations at will. The North Vietnamese Air Force was primarily equipped with the primitive, Soviet-built, gun-armed MiG-17 Fresco, but were also receiving growing numbers of the more advanced MiG-21 Fishbed that could carry two short-range air-to-air missiles. By contrast, the US could field the extremely advanced F-4 Phantom II, which served with both the Air Force and Navy and could carry eight air-to-air -air missiles, four of which could be fired at targets beyond the range of a pilot's own eyesight, being guided by its sophisticated onboard radar. On paper, the F-4 should have been able to decimate the mix. However, the White House rules of engagement demanded that the US pilots visually identify any aircraft they intended to attack, which completely negated the advantage of these long-range missiles, in case the aircraft were Chinese, Soviets, or civilians. At such close ranges, dogfights would break out between the American planes and the mix, but the F-4 was at a significant disadvantage, being heavier and less nimble than the smaller mix. Even more of a problem, the US pilots had done little training in dogfighting tactics, instead focusing on using their missiles, but the missiles themselves were not always reliable. North Vietnamese often resorted to their guns and inflicted losses on the Americans who, on some variants of the Phantom, didn't even have their own gun. This forced a major rethink of US training doctrines, and for the US Navy, the painful experiences over Vietnam in those early days led to the formation of the now legendary Top Gun School. 
The Vietnamese did have their own training problems, however, and that was that they simply didn't have enough pilots qualified to fight the Americans. Research in the 21st century has discovered that to help shore up the number of available pilots, some North Korean pilots volunteered to fly with the North Vietnamese Air Force as part of a secret deal between the two countries. The North Koreans wanted the conflict in Vietnam to divert US attention away from the Korean Peninsula, and so some of the country's best pilots were sent, 14 of whom have now been listed as killed in action. But MiGs were only part of the threat for the US pilots. The most feared weapon by far was the Soviet-supplied SAMs, such as the SA-2 Guideline, which possessed a large warhead, and it was not uncommon for one SAM to destroy two or even three planes flying in tight formation. The only defense in the early days was for US planes to dive into the SAM and try and outmaneuver it. However, this upset the attack force's cohesion and also the reduction in altitude from carrying out the maneuver sometimes put them in range of North Vietnamese anti-aircraft guns. Later in the war, dedicated jamming aircraft would be developed to disrupt the radar sets guiding the missiles. With all these restrictions in place, the US pilots quickly became disillusioned with their mission under Rolling Thunder, renaming it Rolling Blunder. They often likened the operation to fighting a war with one hand tied behind their backs. For the planners at the White House, their overly optimistic projections regarding the breakdown of the Ho Chi Minh government soon passed, and this saw them extend the operation beyond the initially projected eight weeks, and it would be pushed back again and again, going to months and eventually years. To counter the US raids, the Viet Cong began a campaign of attacks against the air bases in South Vietnam, like they had done against Ben Hoa. These attacks caused General Westmoreland to request additional troops to protect them, and President Johnson thus authorized a further expansion of the ground forces in South Vietnam. Meanwhile, the US pilots continued their campaigns, pressing home their attacks with extraordinary bravery, considering the problems in planning. Eventually, 643,000 tons of bombs were dropped, but at the cost of nearly 900 US aircraft, a truly staggering figure. One notable pilot involved in Rolling Thunder was future presidential Republican candidate John McCain. Flying a US Navy A-4 Skyhawk on October 26, 1967, he was shot down by a SAM and would spend six years as a prisoner of war. In South Vietnam, General Westmoreland adopted the general tactic of overwhelming the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army, who were now filtering down south to join the insurgency with superior numbers and, above all, superior firepower. The French had proven the effectiveness of artillery against them, and the ARVN had enjoyed successes in the early search-and-destroy sweeps using helicopters to encircle enemy formations. Westmoreland saw both the advantages and limitations of helicopter-borne operations and quickly conceived counters to the new tactics the Viet Cong were using against the landing zones. Since there were only so many natural landing spots for helicopters, it was easy for the Viet Cong to predict where the American troops would land and set up ambushes, as they had done to great effect at Ap Bac. To counter this, the areas around the landing zones were subjected to powerful artillery and airstrikes to hold back the Viet Cong lying in wait, while the helicopters touched down and unloaded the troops. Later, the US would employ very high explosives, such as the BLU-82, which was nicknamed the Daisy Cutter by troops to destroy large areas of jungle and create a landing zone. All landings had to be carried out at high speed, with the helicopters touching down for barely a few seconds before lifting off again. US troops were trained to spread out as quickly as possible once on the ground, so that mortars or machine gun fire couldn't kill the numerous US troops in a single strike. The US began their own large-scale search-and-destroy missions and made great use of tanks, helicopters, artillery, and air power. The US troops were also joined by contingents of Australian, New Zealand, and South Korean troops, although hopes that British troops would be deployed soon were dashed by London. Westmoreland explained to Washington and his men that the goal would be to kill more Viet Cong than they could replace, while airstrikes in the North would theoretically bring Ho Chi Minh to the peace table. The communists would therefore be forced to give up their aim of conquering the South. In order to destroy such numbers of enemies, however, he would have to engage them in large, pitched battles where they could be overwhelmed and destroyed. <laughs> 
This was something the Viet Cong would not let them do. North Vietnamese General Giap had conceived of four key points with which to combat the Americans and the South Vietnamese. If the enemy advances, we retreat. If the enemy halts, we harass. If he avoids battle, we attack. If the enemy retreats, we attack. By following these basic principles, the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army were always able to prevent themselves from getting drawn into the type of battles West Moreland desired. Instead, they could always dictate when and where the battle would start and when it would end. It was extremely frustrating for US commanders. The US troops soon came to refer to their guerrilla enemy as Charlie, which came about from the NATO phonetic alphabet for VC, Victor Charlie, with the Victor eventually having been dropped for expediency. With US troops now locked in the ground war for South Vietnam, the question of how long a soldier would have to serve in their tour of duty was settled on 12 months for the US Army and six months for the Marines, who would then get a reprieve before returning for another six months. Both branches, however, had incentive programs designed to encourage experienced soldiers to extend their tours so they could pass on their experience to new arrivals from the US. The fighting in Vietnam was unlike most other conflicts the US had found itself embroiled in. There was no real front line, and by that end, no real safe zone behind the lines. Instead, there was what the US termed as area war, meaning sections of the country were contested, usually around strategically important targets such as Saigon. In the south of the country, the Viet Cong were most prevalent, while in the central highlands and near the DMZ, the North Vietnamese army was increasingly more active, often fighting alongside local Viet Cong, and all were supplied by the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In terms of hardware, the ground war in Vietnam was a clash of two iconic rifles. The North Vietnamese made extensive use of the AK-47 assault rifle, which was designed in the Soviet Union after the Second World War and inspired by a German rifle called the STG-44. The AK-47 is one of history's most prolific and successful weapons, being built in the millions, not just in the Soviet Union, but in numerous other countries, and continues to see use the world over almost 75 years later. The typical image of the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese army invariably included its members carrying this recognizable weapon. The AK-47 fired a 7.62 mm round out to an approximate range of 350 meters and had a fire rate of 600 rounds a minute. It was a relatively heavy weapon, but the key to its success was its reliability even in the harsh jungle environment of the Vietnam countryside, where it was exposed to mud and rain on a regular basis. When the US troops first arrived in Vietnam, they were armed with the M14 battle rifle, which replaced the World War II era M1 Garand rifle. It fired a similar size 7.62 mm round, but was heavier than the AK-47, although it enjoyed greater accuracy over longer ranges. However, US forces were soon re-equipping with a new weapon that would become just as iconic as the AK-47, the M16. The M16 was lighter than either the M14 or the AK-47, leading some older soldiers to describe it as being akin to a BB gun. And while it fired a smaller 5.56 round, it had a higher rate of fire and accuracy. When M14 production looked as though it couldn't meet demand with US forces, US Defense Secretary Robert McNamara ordered a halt to any more orders and concentrated on M16 production. The weapon's introduction to combat in Vietnam was not an overwhelming success. Unlike the AK-47, the M16 suffered from chronic reliability issues from combat in the jungle. Stoppages sometimes occurred after only 1,000 rounds had been fired, leading some units to discard the new weapon and reopen their stocks of M14s. In combat, it was not uncommon for US troops to pick up AK-47s from dead enemy soldiers. A crash program was instigated to address the reliability problems, resulting in the M16A1 model, and American soldiers finally had confidence in the new weapon. By 1969, the M16A1 had displaced the M14 as the standard weapon of US and Vietnamese forces. As the months passed by, US troop numbers increased, reaching 385,000 by the end of 1966, thanks to an influx of soldiers drafted to fight the war. But as troop numbers increased, so too did casualties. In 1966 alone, 
the US suffered over 6,000 dead, and while estimates put the Viet Cong's dead at over 61,000, their overall numbers had actually increased, and much of that surge in volunteers was thanks in part to the Americans themselves, and their use of artillery and airstrikes across the country. As Joseph Galloway, an award-winning journalist for UPI during the conflict, explained in a 1995 documentary, quote, You've got a farmer, and he is paying taxes to both sides, and he is doing his best to get by. And you come along in your helicopter and strafe his area and kill his water buffalo. Boy, that makes him angry. You've just hurt his rice bowl. How is he going to farm without his tractor, which is his water buffalo? You come along with the Air Force and drop a bomb down his smokestack and kill his wife and kids. You've just made a Viet Cong. General Westmoreland was forced to admit that his timetable for retrieving victory had long slipped away because the communists refused to meet him in open battle like he had hoped. Worse still, their use of intricate tunnels, booby traps, mortars, and snipers was taking a heavy toll on American troops whose morale, particularly among those who had been drafted to serve in Vietnam, was beginning to fall. After explaining this in a meeting with Defense Secretary Robert McNamara in 1967, McNamara suggested to Johnson that in the short term, even more troops were needed, while a long-term plan should be established to train the South Vietnamese to take over more of the combat role, affording the US an eventual exit from the war. Johnson agreed, and numbers of US troops rose again, eventually peaking at half a million in 1968. It would be easy to suggest that the US were failing, but in fact they had scored several significant victories across South Vietnam against the communists. While the communists continued their policy of refusing to meet in open battle, preferring a fast, ambush style of warfare, American and South Vietnamese forces succeeded in destroying or capturing huge numbers of supplies, disrupting the communist command structure, and destroying bases of operations, particularly in the so-called Iron Triangle near Saigon. In one operation, dubbed Operation Junction City, 240 helicopters along with paratroopers and hundreds of armored vehicles, the largest airborne operation since World War II, killed over 2,700 Viet Cong for the loss of 282 Americans. The problem was, of course, these numbers were a drop in the ocean as far as defeating the Viet Cong, whose overall numbers were estimated to be above a quarter of a million at that time. This excludes the North Vietnamese Army, but while Johnson, McNamara, and Westmoreland were satisfied to play the long game, the American people were growing impatient as more and more of their sons came home in body bags. America in the 1960s was going through radical cultural changes. The stuffy, conservative image of the 1950s was quickly giving away to liberalism and the reassessment of what it meant to be an American. Teenagers particularly enjoyed new freedoms, new entertainment, and new ideas, while the civil rights movement began to gain more and more traction. It was against this backdrop of a changing America that people began to question American policies more than they had done before. When the US began its bombing campaign against the North, a number of American students, mostly those of a left-wing persuasion, began protesting on college campuses. These early protests were largely ignored by the wider public, who in 1965 still supported military intervention in Vietnam. But over the coming years, the number of dissenting voices would grow and include people from all walks of life. This was something of a shock to Johnson's government and the military leadership, who in the past had enjoyed wide-scale patriotic support for defending America's interests overseas. One of the biggest factors of this change in tone was the widespread coverage of the conflict on television. For the first time, people would finish their day's work or studies, come home for dinner, and sit around the TV watching the news which beamed footage of the horrors of what was happening in Vietnam straight into American living rooms. It was almost impossible to escape the broadcasts, and as a result, it was almost impossible not to form an opinion. Protest marches grew and grew until on October 21st, 1967, some 100,000 protesters gathered at the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. Of this group, around 30,000 then proceeded to march on the Pentagon later that night, resulting in a brutal confrontation with soldiers and US Marshals protecting the building. Hundreds of demonstrators were arrested and many more injured, which only fueled further resentment for the war. 
At the same time, the anti-war movement raised racial issues in American society, especially over the draft of black men to serve in the armed forces. Some were angry that society didn't offer the black communities of America the same opportunities that white Americans enjoyed. As such, they had fewer grounds to avoid the draft. Others in the civil rights movement pointed out that the US government wanted black men to go halfway around the world to fight for the rights of another country's people when their own rights in America were still being curtailed. Without doubt, the most famous case of opposition on these grounds was boxer Muhammad Ali, who lost his boxing license and was threatened with imprisonment when he refused military service. In 1967, Martin Luther King became a powerful ally to the anti-war movement when he openly voiced his opposition on moral grounds, condemning the war's diversion of federal funds from domestic programs, as well as the disproportionate number of African-American casualties in relation to the total number of soldiers killed in the war. Nevertheless, there was still a strong majority who supported the war by 1968, and confidence was still high of final victory. However, American resilience at all levels was about to be tested more than ever before. With Rolling Thunder failing to achieve its goal of forcing the North Vietnamese to negotiate, the fighting in South Vietnam ground to a brutal stalemate, composed predominantly of regional engagements by the Viet Cong and the NVA using the Ho Chi Minh Trail to bypass American and South Vietnamese defenses near the DMZ. The Americans were able to aggressively pursue their enemy in South Vietnam, but they proved a most elusive foe, being able to effectively disappear into the dense jungle. By July 1967, the North Vietnamese leadership believed the time was right for a major engagement with the South and their American allies. Recognizing the turbulent political situation in Saigon, South Vietnam having three more leadership changes in two years, and the growing discontent over the war in the United States, they speculated that if enough pressure was put on the Americans, they would no longer be able to maintain the war effort, at least at its present level, without severe political ramifications for President Johnson's Democratic Party. With American support wavering, the troubled government in Saigon would collapse, leaving the country unable to rally a defense and eventually fall. As many as 85,000 men were readied for the major offensive, to lure the South into a false sense of security. In October of 1967, the North announced that it would observe a seven-day truce, starting on January 27th, 1968, and ending on February 3rd, in order to observe the Vietnamese New Year known as Tet. In reality, it was during the middle of this holiday that the communists would strike. But in the days leading up to the ceasefire, neither the American nor South Vietnamese intelligence agencies had any indication of what was happening. To that end, after the truce was called, large numbers of South Vietnamese forces were allowed on leave, meaning they were away from their units when the attack finally came. Shortly after midnight on January 30th, 1968, the US headquarters at Nha Trang were hit by mortar and rocket fire. Seven other bases were hit in quick succession, but in these early hours, it was unclear to the Americans the scale of what was taking place. 24 hours later, the main thrust occurred, and among the cities hit hard was Saigon itself. Airfields in South Vietnam received special attention given the effectiveness of American air power. In some instances, American planes were taking off and bombing NVA and Viet Cong forces just outside and even inside their own perimeters. In Saigon, the Viet Cong had six primary targets to capture, namely the headquarters of the ARVN and Navy, Tan Son Nhut Air Base, the Independence Palace, the US Embassy, and the National Radio Station. The Viet Cong planned to capture a number of South Vietnamese tanks they believed were based at the Army's Armored Forces headquarters, but these tanks had been moved two months earlier. At the national radio station, the attackers attempted to broadcast a recording of Ho Chi Minh calling for the people of the city to rise up in support of the communists. However, they failed and died when they destroyed the building around them rather than be captured. A 19-man team attempted to capture the US Embassy, but were overpowered. As the city's defenders began to wrestle control back, the Viet Cong began fanning out and attacking a number of homes of government officials and military personnel who were on a blacklist. On the morning of February 1st, the chief of the National Police publicly executed a VC officer captured in civilian clothing, 
the image being captured by photographer Edward T. Adams and another cameraman. The image would win the 1969 Pulitzer Prize for spot news photography. The Viet Cong also carried out a series of atrocities against civilians who they felt could not be re-educated to the communist way or remained loyal to the government in Saigon. This included the massacre of up to 6,000 civilians and South Vietnamese soldiers during the Battle of Hue. Days before the Tet Truce was called, a US Marine garrison based at Khe San near the Laos border came under artillery barrage. This barrage signaled the start of the Siege of Khe San, a 77-day battle that was one of the longest and bloodiest engagements of the whole conflict. For the NVA and the Viet Cong, the siege stirred memories of their triumph against the French and dreams of achieving a similar success against the Americans. Unlike the French in 1954, the US had awe-inspiring firepower at their disposal to repel the attacks on the base, including using B-52 strategic bombers to level huge areas of jungle and flying gunships such as the AC-47. As the siege drew on, the intense bombing made parts of the surrounding landscape begin to look like the surface of the moon, with the vegetation wiped out and the ground littered with craters. Back in Washington, a model of the base was constructed for use in briefing President Johnson on the situation. In April, a joint operation by the US Army, Marines, and ARVN, dubbed Operation Pegasus, fought their way to the garrison, freeing the Marines there and ending the siege. However, what should have been a cause for celebration was met with criticism from the US public and their politicians, who questioned the wisdom of choosing to defend the base rather than simply pulling the Marines out of danger. As the fighting dragged on in the wake of the Tet Offensive, a tragedy would occur that would cause far-reaching damage to US prestige and world opinion when US troops from the 23rd Infantry Division carried out the mass murder of unarmed civilians in the Son Tin district of South Vietnam on March 16, 1968. As many as 504 unarmed people were murdered, including men, women, children, and in some cases even infants, while girls as young as 12 were gang raped before being shot in and around the village of Mai Lai, all by American soldiers. 26 soldiers were charged with criminal offenses, but only Lieutenant William Calley Jr. was found guilty of killing 22 villagers. He was originally given a life sentence, but served only three and a half years under house arrest. It would not be until November 1969 that the story was released to the public, only adding fuel to the anti-war sentiment in the United States for the atrocity that the army had committed. Ultimately, the Tet Offensive was a failure for the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. Breaking from their cover, they were simply overwhelmed by superior American firepower, and so they returned to their guerrilla style of warfare back in the countryside. However, in an ironic twist, the Tet Offensive would provide the communists with their biggest political victory. The dramatic rise in US casualties during the offensive finally began to wear down the US people's resolve to continue the war. This was demonstrated in the New Hampshire primary, when 42% of the Democrat votes went to Eugene McCarthy, who campaigned on a platform of promising to pull American troops out of Vietnam. Johnson only marginally defeated him, achieving 49%, but it was clear that things had to change. Johnson's government was already looking at meeting the North Vietnamese in peace talks, and as a gesture to encourage this, he ordered first a drawdown of Operation Rolling Thunder, and eventually ordered a suspension, which ended airstrikes against North Vietnam. On March 31st, 1968, he spoke to the public regarding future measures to limit American involvement in the Vietnam War. During the speech, he would say, I shall not seek and I will not accept the nomination of my party for another term as your president. US public opinion in support of the war had plummeted down to just 26%, with around 30,000 Americans having died in Vietnam between 1961 and 1968, and Johnson would be forced to assume responsibility as the 1968 elections loomed. The Democrats were defeated, and into the White House stepped Republican Richard M. Nixon, leaving Johnson to stand down with a legacy of being the man who had led America into its most disastrous war to date, ignoring the fact that he had inherited the situation in Vietnam from Kennedy 
who was still a much-loved figure in the US. Nixon had campaigned on a promise to get half a million US troops, airmen and sailors out of Vietnam one way or another, but he secretly confided to colleagues that in his opinion, the war could not be won, at least in a military context. He did believe, however, that he could convince the North Vietnamese to sue for peace if he projected an image of a man who was volatile and unstable, what he referred to as the madman theory, and was the exact opposite of the rather tepid view the world had of Johnson. Regardless of how the North viewed Nixon, he was determined to start drawing down US forces in Vietnam, but he was also adamant to do so in a way that didn't make it appear as an American defeat. He continued efforts to negotiate with the North Vietnamese in Paris, but insisted they had to include the South Vietnamese government, which Hanoi initially refused to recognize. The North Vietnamese resolve only hardened when on September 2nd, 1969, their great leader Ho Chi Minh died after years of ailing health. They now wanted victory in order to honor the man they saw as having freed them. At the same time as pursuing peace talks, Nixon instigated a policy of Vietnamization regarding combat operations, in which more training and equipment would be supplied to the ARVN to allow them to begin replacing the initial US units being sent home in 1969. Leading this increasingly leaner US force was General Creighton Abrams, who replaced Westmoreland in June of 1968. Westmoreland had repeatedly been at odds with Johnson's administration by that time, as he had been calling for ground operations to be expanded into Cambodia and Laos to finally shut down the Ho Chi Minh Trail and strangle the communist forces in the south. In one of the more shocking revelations to come out later, it was discovered that he had ordered preparations be made for nuclear weapons to be readied as a contingency plan under Operation Fractured Jaw something the White House put a stop to immediately once they learned of it. Johnson wouldn't expand the war, but Nixon was more than willing to. In March 1969, following a new communist offensive, Nixon ordered USAF B-52s to launch a campaign against the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Cambodia, but controversially without congressional or even Cambodian permission. Flight logs were even altered to conceal the bomber crew's missions. A year later, US and South Vietnamese troops finally went on the offensive against the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese army positions in Cambodia. A CIA-sponsored coup in Cambodia saw Cambodian troops finally engage the communist troops in their country after years of turning a blind eye. All this widened the scope of the war, but in doing so, further infuriated the anti-war movement at home, leading to violence at demonstrations on US college campuses especially. During a protest at Kent State University in Ohio on May 4, 1970, violence erupted between protesters and National Guardsmen, resulting in four protesters being shot dead. For many who completed their first tours of duty, the dream of returning home often soured when they saw the hostile reception waiting for them, such as being spat upon at airports by protesters. In many cases, this saw some of these men volunteer for a second tour. In 2020, Mississippi man Clyde Moore, who did three tours in Vietnam with the Air Force, explained this sentiment in an interview, saying, You're going to think I'm crazy when I tell you this. I felt more comfortable over there, because you knew what was going on, and we really stuck together over there. It was a different world. The unrest at home filtered back to US forces, who weren't part of the initial withdrawal. Deep-rooted divisions among race, class, and even religious backgrounds all came to the surface, leaving many US units lacking military cohesion, and in many cases, basic military discipline. In the period between 1969 and 1971, there were a staggering 700 recorded assaults on officers by soldiers, and at least 83 resulted in the officer being killed. The situation was exacerbated by widespread drug abuse amongst the ranks, and with US combat operations becoming more defensive in nature through 1970 and 1971, Four times as many soldiers were treated for the effects of drug abuse than from combat with the enemy. With more and more US troops being withdrawn, the general mood was that no one wanted to be remembered as the last man to die in Vietnam. For the South Vietnamese armed forces, Vietnamization of the fighting saw their numbers swell dramatically thanks to greater investment in weapons and training by the Americans and widespread drafting of men to fill their ranks. 
At one point, the South Vietnamese Air Force had an inventory of aircraft that would make it the fourth largest in the world, although these were mostly light ground attack types and a handful of supersonic jets, such as the Northrop F-5 Freedom Fighter. It was time for the rejuvenated ARVN and the policy of Vietnamization itself to be tested. On February 8, 1971, they undertook Operation Lam Sun 719, which saw 20,000 troops supported by tanks and helicopters strike out into Laos to attack the Ho Chi Minh Trail and destroy NVA regional command posts. US forces would be limited to providing air support only since Congress had now banned the use of US ground forces outside of South Vietnam. The operation was a disaster. Numbers of casualties vary depending on the source, but some claim as many as 8,000 South Vietnamese were killed, while tanks and helicopters were left abandoned in the field. The Lam Sun 719 disaster did not inspire confidence that the South Vietnamese would be able to defend themselves when the US finally withdrew and this made brokering a peace deal especially important. With negotiations in Paris and some behind-the-scenes talks having stalled, Nixon instead decided to approach the Soviet Union and China for help in encouraging the North Vietnamese to agree to a peace settlement. Like the US, neither Beijing nor Moscow wanted the war to go on any longer, although neither were willing to suspend arms shipments to North Vietnam. This would eventually lead President Nixon making a historic visit to China in 1972, the first sitting US president to do so, where, among other things, they discussed putting pressure on Hanoi to end the war. The North Vietnamese refused to listen. By January 1972, of the half a million US troops in Vietnam when he came to office, Nixon had now dwindled that number to around 130,000, and most of the fighting against the communists was done by the ARVN. The US still maintained powerful air, naval, and artillery forces in South Vietnam to support the South Vietnamese, but they themselves mainly took a defensive posture, save for a number of advisors who joined the ARVN on operations. Spurred on by the ARVN's poor showing in Laos, the North Vietnamese army decided on a bold new offensive in 1972 that was unlike any they had attempted before. Like in Tet, they would once again break cover and engage the ARVN and any American units they encountered in a pitched battle. The difference this time, however, was rather than a predominantly infantry force, the North Vietnamese would utilize large numbers of tanks, giving them their own heavy firepower to bring down on the enemy. The vast majority of tanks at their disposal were Soviet-supplied T-54s and amphibious PT-76s, which would prove invaluable in crossing rivers, but their number also included some World War II vintage T-34-85s. The offensive began on March 30th, 1972, with 30,000 men thrust across the DMZ and from Laos. On April 5th, 20,000 more communist troops had attacked from Cambodia, by which time Nixon had sanctioned a response in the form of the resumption of the bombing of North Vietnam by American aircraft, aimed at disrupting the supply lines to the communist forces in the South. Unlike the previous Rolling Thunder campaign, the new campaign would not forbid attacks on the port city of Haiphong, where a great deal of the Soviet equipment was being delivered. US planes would drop 11,000 mines in the entrance to Haiphong and other harbors, disrupting some 85% of North Vietnam's military imports. The next targets were rail yards and railway bridges that led to China, and this saw the first use of laser-guided bombs in war when they were dropped by F-4 Phantoms on April 27th. Nixon then authorized a more comprehensive campaign aimed at isolating North Vietnam from outside supplies and destroying its ability to store and transport supplies to the front lines in the South. 414 missions were flown on the first day of Operation Linebacker alone, and once again, the North Vietnamese Air Force rose to meet the American attackers. Now, however, the situation was far less in their favor, with the US Navy pilots especially having been fully retrained, not just in air-to-air -air combat, but specifically to combat the MiGs fielded by the NVAF. US forces would turn down 11 MiGs on the first day in the most intense air combat of the war, but by no means was the MiG threat negated, with the NVAF shooting down five F-4s on May 10th. 
The impact of linebacker was almost immediately felt in the South, as the communist forces became starved of ammunition, fuel, and supplies. As much as 70% of supplies earmarked for the offensive were either destroyed or stopped from reaching the forces at the front, who were also, themselves, the subject of intense aerial bombardment. And by the summer, the offensive had stalled. The North Vietnamese once again returned to peace talks, and Nixon ordered the airstrikes now be limited to south of the 20th parallel. Over the coming months, US National Security Advisor Dr. Henry Kissinger and North Vietnamese Politburo member Le Duc Tho would meet in Paris to discuss peace terms. Among the terms discussed was a pledge by the North to stop sending its forces south and release a number of US POWs. The US agreed to withdraw all its forces and establish a power-sharing agreement in the South between the Viet Cong and the Saigon government. It looked as though peace was at hand, except for that in Saigon, South Vietnamese President Nguyen Van Thieu refused to agree to them. The main problem was that after fighting a war for South Vietnamese independence, the US was now handing power over to the Viet Cong. Kissinger tried to negotiate with both sides of the political divide, but it was to no avail. On December 16, 1972, the North Vietnamese pulled out of peace talks. Nixon was furious. In order to force the North back to the peace table, Nixon ordered Operation Linebacker 2, the unrestricted bombing of North Vietnam. On December 18, 1972, 129 B-52 bombers, supported by numerous tankers and fighters, launched a massive bombing campaign against Hanoi and three NVAF airfields. Three of these bombers would be downed by SA-2 surface-to-air missiles. The next night, another force of bombers attacked rail yards and a power station, and would see seven more B-52s being taken out by SAMs. The bombings would continue until December 24th, when a 36-hour Christmas halt was ordered, during which time the USAF leaders came under intense scrutiny for the losses sustained by the B-52s. Operations resumed on December 26th, with a massive aerial bombardment across North Vietnam, including in and around Hanoi and Haiphong. Greater support was given to the B-52s, including jamming aircraft such as the Navy's EA-6A, the forerunner to the famous EA-6B Prowler, and dedicated aircraft designed to seek out and destroy the radars guiding the SAMs, known as Wild Weasels. B-52 losses dropped off, but the force was still far from coming out unscathed. The bombing would continue until December 29th and inflicted massive damage to the North Vietnamese infrastructure. There was widespread condemnation of the bombing, particularly when Hanoi showed pictures of a hospital that was caught in the devastation and claimed that 1,624 civilians had perished in the campaign. However, the North Vietnamese did agree to return to Paris, although they wished to make it clear that it was in the interests of peace and not because of the bombing. The North Vietnamese refused to change the terms they had agreed to in the earlier agreements, and this saw the same refusals from President Thieu. Nixon weighed in and threatened to have Thieu deposed, and so, with little choice in the matter, he agreed. On January 27, 1973, the US signed the agreement as the Paris Peace Accords, and the next day, a formal ceasefire was declared. Nixon had what he believed to be his peace with honor. The US wasted no time in withdrawing its last combat forces, and North Vietnam began releasing US prisoners of war, including John McCain. Many of them were in an extremely poor state, having endured years of physical abuse, and McCain himself had trouble raising his arms above his shoulder for the rest of his life. On March 29, 1973, the last US military unit left Vietnam, and on June 19th, Congress passed an act forbidding any future US involvement in military operations in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, while the US Navy began clearing away the mines it had laid off North Vietnam. From the half a million men in 1968, on December 31st, 1973, there were just 50 US service personnel in Vietnam. While Nixon had delivered on his promise to get the troops out, the fighting continued with sporadic battles between the Viet Cong and ARVN forces. American troops would still find themselves caught up in these engagements, and 168 Americans died in Vietnam in 1973, 
despite the Paris Peace Accords. Neither side trusted the other and frequently accused one another of breaking the peace accords, nor did the fighting show any sign of ending as 1974 dawned and the situation was made worse for President Theo when the US began withdrawing some of its financial support as it tried to distance itself from Vietnam as much as possible. After much deliberation, the Communist Party in Hanoi voted to attack South Vietnam again in a series of fresh offensives described as land grabs by the South Vietnamese. President Theo was relying on the resumption of airstrikes by the US to defend his country, but Congress had tied Nixon's hands and South Vietnam was now alone. Spurred on, the North Vietnamese launched a fresh offensive in March of 1974 and began a rout of the ARVN. The ARVN did launch a successful counterattack against enemy positions in Cambodia, but the cost was so high that there was little to celebrate. At the same time, the ARVN was being bled to death, with mass desertions while transporting supplies was disrupted by a flood of refugees on the roads escaping the fighting. In December of 1974, the communists defeated the ARVN just 75 miles northeast of Saigon, having attacked from bases in Cambodia. The North Vietnamese waited for American intervention, but again, nothing materialized. By that time, Nixon had been ousted as president following the Watergate scandal, and despite his desire to aid the South Vietnamese, newly installed President Gerald Ford was forbidden to do so by Congress. Believing there was nothing left to stop them, the North Vietnamese army prepared for yet another offensive in March 1975. They predicted the campaign to capture Saigon and secure South Vietnam would last around two years. The offensive began on March 10, 1975, but within a month, the ARVN began to completely collapse, with 100,000 of them being taken prisoner. On April 4, 1975, the US began evacuating children out of South Vietnam to escape the fighting. Dubbed Operation Babylift, the first aircraft involved, a massive C-5 Galaxy, crashed on takeoff, killing 138 people, including 78 children. The North Vietnamese Army and Viet Cong pushed on towards Saigon, and on April 21, 1975, President Theo made a speech in which he blamed the United States for the fall of South Vietnam before resigning and escaping to Taiwan. His successor, Tran Van Huang, would stay in office one week before resigning and handing the government over to General Man Vin, the same man who had overthrown President Diem in 1963. With Saigon surrounded, Vin surrendered two days later on April 30th. At the US Embassy, there was a desperate effort to evacuate American staff and civilians to waiting US warships. Thousands of Saigon residents surrounded the embassy, hoping to get a ride on one of the evacuation helicopters, but few did. ARVN and South Vietnamese Air Force pilots often put their families aboard their military aircraft and flew out to the US ships, sometimes crashing them into the sea to force American sailors to rescue them. The North Vietnamese would consolidate their hold on the South before formally unifying the country as the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. To honor his memory, Saigon was renamed Ho Chi Minh City. The war for Vietnamese unification after the First Indochina War lasted 19 years, five months, four weeks, and one day. It would claim the lives of almost four million Vietnamese. To the United States, Vietnam is a wound that will likely not heal for several generations. 53,318 US service personnel would lose their lives in the war, and it would leave a profound impact on the US psyche, affecting foreign and even domestic policies for years to come. Questions over the wisdom of the war, the conduct of US troops, and the tactics and technology involved will be debated amongst historians for years to come. In Washington, a memorial was erected in 1982, commemorating all those US personnel who died in the conflict and lists of each of their names. As with most conflicts in the decades afterwards, more and more of the story of the US involvement in the war has been brought to light in books and journals, so that the soldiers' personal stories, which are often overlooked in the history books, aren't forgotten. In 2015, Gregory Hamilton published the book McNamara's Folly, the use of low IQ soldiers in the Vietnam War. This tells the tragic tale of the drafting of often mentally handicapped men to serve in the military, something they were wholly unsuited to. 
In 2020, Larry Sanders published his book, chronicling what it was like to be a secret gay soldier in the war and the risks of discovery posed in the US military. In recent years, there has been a growing improvement in US-Vietnamese relations, with American holidaymakers visiting the country to tour the battlegrounds where their grandfathers or fathers would have fought in the 60s and 70s. Even more significantly, in 2018, the US aircraft carrier USS Carl Vinson made a diplomatic visit to the port of Da Nang, the first time an American carrier had visited the country since the war, which was followed up by a visit from the USS Theodore Roosevelt in March of 2020. Hopefully this improvement in relations will help lay to rest the ghosts of this brutal and bloody war that had such a profound impact on the world far beyond the battlefields on which it was fought.